Okay. So, welcome to uh, February's select board meeting for February 19th, a Tuesday night. Um, our agenda is fairly full. We'll start with uh, approving the agenda as presented, unless there's some changes. Make the motion that we approve the agenda as presented. Second that. No further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 The consent agenda items. Uh, minutes of January 28th meeting. A fairly big liquor license uh, list for Cold Hollow Cider Mill, Butler Street Pizza, Village Market, Prohibition Pig, American Legion, Thai Smile Restaurant, Fast Stop, Champlain Farms, Kinney's, Cabot Foods, Oak Hill Corporation, and then a permit for a festival for permit for a not quite Independence Day on June 29th from 1 to 10 at the Rusty Park, Rusty Park Beer Garden, Rusty Parker Park Beer Garden. And last is a re signed certificate of highway mileage. Is there a motion to approve this, please? I'll move that we approve the consent agenda items as listed. Second it. Second that. Okay. Any further discussion? None. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And the public. Is there any public ever come up and speak? Maybe we should just change public to Everett Coffee. <laughs> Obviously, I'd like to grab it. Oh, good time. What I'm going to say has absolutely nothing to do with the state police, the quality of the work they're doing, which I think is great. We've seen more blue lights in the last several months than we did for a number of years. What I am concerned about, and I know it's going to be extremely difficult to do, uh, I'm hoping that you're going to find someone who is uh, so excited about having something on their agenda that we can find somebody to be the meter man, the meter maid, call them whatever you wish. They do not have to be a law enforcement person. Uh, we have a lot of problems on the end of Lusky Street uh, with henders, people parking crossways of the street, parking right next to the corner, etc. cetera. And uh, I didn't see it personally, I didn't pay attention, but unless she's got a new sign out, if she does that makes four, that's a bit more than the uh, the legal amount, I think, but uh, there's cars parking left of the curb, there's cars parked very in unsafe positions, and I think this has nothing to do with VSP, with Cho and the new gentleman, but I think it's something we need to look forward to, and it's not going to be an easy task to find somebody that that's so excited or foolish that we want to look at to do the job. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, guess not. Uh, we'll move ahead. Uh, how about a discussion with the Vermont State Police? So let me see if I can get Dave on the line here. And Joe, if you want to come up here, we'll give you a hot mic. This is Mark Matera, and you're on live on a speaker phone at our select board meeting here in Waterbury. Um, we, we, we've got your sacrificial guy lined up here to, uh, to speak as well. Joe is with us. And um, so I will let uh, the, the chair uh, just uh, speak about any particular issues and flow that he wants to go with this, and then we'll, we'll get moving along. Good evening, Dave. Uh, thanks for being available here tonight. Certainly. Um, for, uh, for not being there in person, but um, training assignments had me uh, 
away from my normal duties for a couple of days this week. Yeah, totally understood. I uh, appreciate you being available by phone. Sure. Um, so I guess tonight there, uh, the information that Mark sent us there, going over um, uh, the stats there on um, calls and whatnot. Um, can you give us a little bit of an insight as to how you think things are working here so far based based on the, the program that we're under? So looking at the um, one graph here that we have um, on uh, the amount of calls that the Middlesex troopers versus the resident troopers, uh, there's about a 7% divide there, 43% uh, Middlesex troop response, response and then 57% uh, um, resident troopers. Uh, I, I guess that kind of probably got me more curious than anything about uh, why that number is so close based on the, the days that uh, the resident troopers are here um, and the remaining days that they're not here. I'm curious to know uh, when the uh, Middlesex troopers are seeing most of their calls um, and uh, I guess I, bottom line is I, I was hoping at some point, um, and I don't want to go shooting myself in the foot here, but uh, I was hoping to see that the resident troopers were taking up more of the middle sex graph than, than they currently are, only from the perspective that uh, to relieve pressure off from middle sex, uh, to allow the, the troopers that are responding here in town to uh, perhaps be more available elsewhere. Um, can you lend any information towards that? Um, those, I mean, the, that number completely goes with the, the obviously the, the guys working the contract aren't around during the day on the weekends and then um, Saturday and um, or Sunday and Monday evenings. Um, so I think a lot of the the calls that uh, just just looking over them, most of the calls seem to uh, that we're taking are are coming in um, during the during the weekend, during the daytime, uh, which is um, a a time when the, the Waterbury resident trooper day shift trooper is not there. Um, so that. That's going to take a lot of it, you know, and I think that just kind of goes with uh, your area and the amount of traffic and the amount of folks that, that come and go um, through Waterbury on the weekends. I think it's just kind of the uh, the nature of the beast. But to that end, you know, if if not for the contract, then all of that would uh, all of those cases during the week would obviously fall to the mental sex troopers. So there's a, there's certainly, uh, even even with that number so close, the uh, the amounts that it's taking off of the shoulders of the, the troopers in middle sex is, is great uh, because otherwise those would, that would be um, time in which they would be dealing with those calls instead of dealing with other things. Um, actually, Dave, this is Mark Matera. I'm going to uh, have the board look at a trend uh, uh, graph that I included on the six-month run. And it actually does a pretty good job of showing that differential with, uh, with the coverages. When we started in July, um, of course, uh, Rick, Rick was on some lead time initially, and Joe was was here full-time, and at that point, 
the Middlesex troops still covered most of uh, the calls. And the, the two lines, the orange line, are the resident troopers, and the gray line represent the station troopers. And uh, you can see during the, the main part of the fall and everything, it, uh, very clearly, the resident troopers were pulling uh, much more of a share of, of the total calls. When we get into uh, November, December, um, that's when Rick was getting ready to uh, uh, pull the pin, and he was burning up some leave time, and then was gone for a while, and then you had the transition, uh, getting Keith on board, and so that, that flipped a little bit. Um, and uh, I know we spoke about January. January has that uh, same sort of offside tilt where it looks like the uh, station troopers are picking up more than the resident troopers, but um, there was some uh, uh, National Guard duty and some leave time affiliated with that too. But I think the most important thing we're hearing from you, and uh, we'll, we'll pick Joe's brain a little bit on this too, is that it seems as though the station troopers appreciate the fact that they've got somebody here to cover the workload out of Waterbury, and uh, the Waterbury troops are are uh, making an impact with what they're taking off the burden for the station troops. Oh yeah, with, without a doubt. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can, uh, it doesn't take, you don't have to get too deep into the troop room to, to ask how they feel about Waterbury because um, the guys that have, that have been around um, know how, how often we were, we were dealing with calls, uh, even within the town, not even dealing with the village. And uh, you know they're they're certainly they they know when when the uh, the Waterbury troops aren't aren't working. So. so I imagine this may be a tricky question as well, um, and maybe even po impossible to answer. Uh, I don't know how familiar familiar you were with the. Um, with the village police department when it was here, and I'm curious to know if you have any indication as to uh, maybe how much uh, more or less is being done uh, with the resident troopers here as opposed to having what village police force was here prior. Uh, and I don't even know if you could even track, you know, responses in the village versus responses in the town. Oh, yeah. Um, as as we track it, it's just Waterbury, whereas um, we don't use the the village um, location code uh, through with with our um, with our coding through our, our dispatch uh, computer aided dispatch system. So uh, we just everything is just Waterbury. I think too that. Um, you know, certain types of activity that you could match up um, one to one, but um, the village police force did different types of policing than the troopers do. So, you know, there's no parking enforcement happening now. That's that's not a knock against the state police. We knew going in that they weren't going to be doing that. The village police did quite a bit of that. Um, you know, uh, general uh, door checking and, and, you know, in and out of businesses, while certainly the last few years of the Waterbury Police Department, that was a challenge to get that to happen. It, it's just a different kind of police force, and it's a different activity that these folks do. Um, uh, it would be interesting to see as time goes on in terms of the traffic stops and things like that. I know that... Um, certainly outside the village, there's far more traffic stops, at least anecdotally, observation-wise, than there were before. I see people pulled over um, now, whereas back in the day, before this contract, not that they didn't do traffic enforcement in Waterbury, but they weren't here um, 80 hours a week doing that kind of work. So it, it's hard to measure in many respects, but I think the service that we're getting now uh, and the activity that this shows is, is good. Um, 
just to your earlier point, Chris, you know, um, I think is the state troopers on about 16 hours a day out of the Middlesex barracks in general? Uh, they, usually, outside of this contract? Yeah, they usually go from uh, 7 a.m. till 2 in the morning. Okay. So, what's that? So, are you, are you, um, are you suggesting that the, uh, the, there's a larger volume of, of uh, well, I guess, calls on the, on the Saturday, Sunday kind of time frame as opposed to the rest of the week as a rule? I mean, yeah, I'd say during the weekends are definitely busier. Um, before I also forget this point, um, as far as like the Middlesex troopers and the, the Waterbury troopers like taking the calls, um, for example, like Saturday night, I was dealing with a, uh, a woman who crashed and who was drunk. So then after that, the other calls that came in, the, the Middlesex troopers had to take. So that goes towards the, the 50% sure. of, of that or whatever the number was. So. Um, just when I'm tied up, the Middlesex troopers, even while I'm on shift, have to take the calls that come in. Like, it just happened to be a family fight that happened, so they had to respond to that. But. So, if, did you take Richard's place? I'm on night no. shift. Oh, it's the night shift. I'm on, I'm on night shift. Um, are you seeing more activity in the village or in the center? I'd say definitely in the center. Really? It's where it's been busier. Um, one of the questions that uh, um, one of the residents asked me here, um, when you're on Route 100, uh, that's part of our area. Um, if we pick up people there for speeding, I mean, do the speeding, t how, do, how do the revenues that come from the tickets work? Do they go to the town or the state well, police? Or, or it, it's going to depend on how the trooper codes the ticket. So, uh, if they're on Guptill Road and they write a ticket on the municipal ordinance, it's it's town revenue and the, the town does get the money. Um, I don't remember at this point whether the town has a piggyback ordinance. Uh, the village used to have a uh, an ordinance that covered sections of Route 100 as well. So if if uh, if Waterbury police officers stop somebody going up the ramp, for example, on Route 100 or in front of Billings Mobile, even though it's a state posted speed limit, uh, they could write that on a village ordinance because the state statute allows you to overlay across that ordinance. I would imagine the troopers, if they're writing an ordinance, a ticket on Route 100, they're using the state statute and that probably goes to the state. Well, the concern from the resident was that, you know, is Waterbury paying for the troop, the resident trooper being on 100? Well, Route 100 is in Waterbury. No, so. I'm saying, yeah, don't uh, no, I, I, misunderstand I, what I'm trying to get here, get a point I'm trying to get across. They were just wanting to make sure that, you know, if, if we were spending tax dollars for a trooper on Route 100, they were curious to know whether we were getting the money from the tickets as well as part of that. So that was the question that I was asked to ask. Well, I know uh, Dave, Dave has broken out uh, some of the stuff on the uh, uh, violations. And for the most part, um, I, I know when, uh, when Joe and Rick first started, we, we had the discussion over that. We provided them with the updated uh, uh, municipal ordinance listing that we have. And generally speaking, the speeding violations and probably some of the stop sign violations, if, if they come up, are within the purview of um, the municipal ordinances. But a lot of the other stuff, like the DUIs and uh, the driving the license suspended right. and everything, are all state violations. The, the only violations that we can get fine money from are speeding and stop signs. Uh, any kind of defective equipment, uh, crosswalk enforcement, um, uh, DUI certainly, none of that revenue comes to the town. It didn't even come, you know, when the village police wrote those kind of tickets, it went to the state too. It's not, it doesn't come to a municipality, so. So Dave, has there been any uh, discussion um, amongst the higher ups there as to, um, and this is just a generic question as to whether or not um, this same program might be beneficial elsewhere in other towns? Uh, there, I mean, I know that there is uh, a number of different um, local uh, 
uh, jurisdictions that are, are certainly keeping a close eye on how this uh, water project um, all pans out. I think at this point, um, obviously, uh, I can't fully speak for our senior command. I know that they're they're very interested to see how this all plays out. The, probably the biggest thing um, from a state police standpoint is, you know, these this project, this contract <coughs> added two people to our um, overall number, and you know, it's it's great as long as we have the numbers to fill it. But um, just as soon as the, the barracks, you know, staffing issues and things like that um, start going down, then you know we we might have, we we would look at having to pull from these contracts if we got you know really big into the this contract business. So um, I think they they really want to see how this uh, how this shakes out uh, long term wise, just to make sure that we're not overstepping. Um, and you know, committing to these contracts that um, we may not be able to, uh, to fully staff. Yeah. And one of the things that we've looked at with uh, the data that we're trying to capture is to just get a sense of um, what the workload looks like, and also one of the issues around uh, whether uh, station troopers or the resident troopers are covering calls is really because we. Uh, when we established the, the shifts and the coverages, it was based on what traditionally looked to be uh, the primary workload um, components. And if what we were seeing over a period of time was that we had missed the mark on that, um, it would give us the opportunity to adjust. But I have to say the only variation we've seen in that um, split between the resident troopers and the uh, station troops really has uh, been a result of um, uh, covering for some leave absences. And it looks as though really what we've um, picked out for shift coverages uh, meet the needs for the bulk of uh, the service calls. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, Joe, someone asked me to uh, a week or so ago What's your estimate of the of the 80 hours that of the 40 hours that you're working? Um, how many of those hours do you actually feel that you're in Waterbury? Um, I had somebody say, "Well, you know, that this is great for the state police because they get to have their people in Middlesex running around and, and they're getting paid by Waterbury." I said, mm, "I don't think that's the way it's supposed to work. They're supposed to be here, and I think you are, but." I'll let you answer that. Um, so I, you know, every shift it takes me probably 35 minutes to get here, depending on traffic. So I sign on at 5 p.m. and I'm here probably um, 5:35 to 5:40, and then you know at the same time going home. But um, unless I have to run up to the barracks because I don't have everything here right in Waterbury that I need, like um, to download my um, video camera, I have to go up to the barracks and, and download that and everything. Um, just because we don't have the the computer and everything here, so if I have to run up to the barracks, you know that. So it might take an hour. And a, yeah, if and that, you know. Time yeah, else. travel time and, and downloading it and stuff like that. But um, you know that usually will last me a whole week without having to download my thumb drive. So. So from your perspective, you're pretty much in Waterbury when you're working. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then a lot of the other troopers. Reception is, so. And then a lot of the other troopers, you know, they they come in town as well. So, um, just to, library is busy, and they like to be in town also. And have you had an occasion? And Dave, you can answer this as well. Um, I know there are times, and you just gave a good example when a troop had to come in and take a call because you were tied up. The troopers who were assigned to library, I assume that there would be a reciprocal kind of situation where if there's a lot of action happening and then there's a call somewhere else, do you folks have to go to Duxbury or Moortown or whatever to, to take a call or is that just in a real emergency situation? I think since I've been here, I've taken three or four calls out of out of Waterbury. You know, just everyone else has been tied up and, and something happened. So, but it, I can count them all in one hand that I've had to leave the town for. So the Middlesex troops are 
doing much more in Waterbury than the Waterbury troops are doing outside of Waterbury, right? By far. Okay, yeah. good. That's what I hoped you said. <laughs> Not that we object to you going if you need it, but, uh, you know, and, and I think that's really, I look at that as a, not necessarily a negative thing, that, um, you know, we're paying for the state police to be here for 80 hours a week, but it's not to the exclusion of getting coverage from the Middlesex barracks. If they're needed, they're going to be here. So if they're taking 43% of the calls, I think we're getting a higher level of service than we would be otherwise. If we just said, sorry, the two guys in Waterbury have to take everything and nobody else from Middlesex ever comes into Waterbury, I think our value would be diminished. So I don't see that as a big problem. And the other the other point with that, Bill, is that oftentimes um, cases are triaged, calls are triaged, and by having the presence of the two troopers here in town, I'm sure we get responses to stuff that um, might sit on a shelf and not, not get any answer. So um, I, I think it puts us in a good position, but it also gives you the opportunity to know the community that much better. Right. You mentioned a minute ago there about downloading. Um, is there any benefit one way or the other, or is that something that we could, I don't know what it takes to do that. Uh, so we have it into their system. So. Yeah, but we, and I, I, this is just, again, it's a question. Uh, is it worth looking at us being supplying that ability for you to do it here at the fire station or no? Well, I'm not sure what's involved, but yeah, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, so it's a, um, and what it is is it, all of our videos are downloaded onto our, uh, the, our cloud for the state police. So they have it all in their computer system and whenever we have like an arrest or something that, that's all caught on video. So that's all downloaded. So then when um, it goes to court or something, the, uh, the clerks at the barracks, they have, they, they run the discs and everything, get it to the uh, defense attorney. So I, I just think it'd be a little difficult if um, we had it at the fire department for like the clerks to- well, I didn't know if it could be done at the fire department and sent to Middlesex. But I think from the time perspective, I didn't know if it was beneficial. Well, I, I'm not sure exactly what's involved, but uh, knowing what little I do know about, uh, you know, uh, whatever, technology. Uh, data technology and, this, and the like, um, you know, I'm sure the state has, it's a secure system, it's their system, their people are going to have to be involved in it, their IT people, so I think it, I think that while it might save a couple of minutes in terms of driving to Middlesex, I think the overhead and the expense involved in having a, a new port and, and have to maintain that would probably not be worth it. Anything else to add, Dave? Uh, I don't think I, uh, I have anything um, real important to add. Okay. Um, on the graph here, you've got property incidences, you've got disputes between persons, obviously service assistance is pretty much, a, you know, explanatory, self-explanatory. Um, the property incidences and the disputes uh, between persons, can you just touch a little bit on what some of those things are about? Question for Joe. Um, you know, they can be like vandalisms for the property stuff. Um, people calling in theft complaints as far as the uh, the property disputes and then um, the other disturbances are like family fights or you know people actually get into fights or, or assaults on on everyone is that's what those are when we um, uh, did the research prior to entering into this project we really uh, took a look at what the nature of calls were here in Waterbury and we we took a multi-year perspective and we looked at the Village PD as well as the, the state police calls and uh, frankly the, the breakdown that we're seeing is pretty consistent with what, what we saw over that multi-year period. Um, it shifts a little bit from month to month which is why uh, keeping a running tally on this will give us a better picture but 
Um, and and uh, most circumstances, the the uh, um, true crime aspect of stuff is fortunately a, a smaller proportion of of the overall. It's uh, the traffic related stuff, the calls for service, um, a lot of uh, uh, interactions that take place to keep stuff from getting out of control. And um, we seem to be staying along that same trend. Let's hope we can continue that. Uh, Dave, if you've got anything else to add, or, uh, or if you don't, we can kind of let you off the hook. And, uh, Joe as well, unless you've got something you'd want to add. Yeah, I got uh, one more thing. Okay. Um, we're, we're starting this, it's called intelligence-based policing. It's a new, uh, actually the Middlesex Barracks is doing it as well. What was it, intelligence? Intelligence-based policing. So that's the name of it. And what that is is where um, troopers will go and they'll meet with the community members at different locations. And um, Keith and I are actually starting this in Waterbury now. So like twice a month we're gonna meet and um, we spoke with um, Chief Dillon at the fire station and he has allowed us on Thursdays, late afternoons, early evenings to host these meetings with the community right at the, uh, the fire department. So, you know, people are welcome. They're gonna send a press release and everything like this to uh, for the town, but our one we're um, first starting is the 28th of this month at uh, 3.30 to 4.30 at the fire department. And that just, you know, everyone is welcome to come and just meet with Keith and I and just talk with us about issues. And this can go as far as like someone who's having trouble with their heating, um, paying their heating bill, you know, seeing what we can help them with, to, you know, someone who's driving drunk all the time, just any information. And then we just try to, uh, to work with that the best we can. So um, we're going to send out a press release and anyone who can make it is welcome to comment and meet with us. And, uh, you know, it's just if people are seeing things that we're not, just bring it to our attention and uh, we'll, we'll deal with the best we can. So that we're hoping to do that twice a month. And if it doesn't work for people, um, we're just, we're trying it at 3.30 to 4.30 for the first one. And if that's too early in the day, then we can adjust and, and do it later in the evening. Um, Keith is willing to adjust his schedule as well to sign on later in the day, later in the morning, and that way he can work into the evening as well so we can both be there. So I just wanted to let everyone know about that as well. So, so. the goal of basic is a little bit of personal interaction yeah, with we the people who are residents here in the town and to get to know them right. and get to just, know you. And Yep, everyone right. just come and, you know, if someone's saying, hey, my neighbor is having problems with uh, paying their, their heating bill, you know, we can see what we can do to provide services for that. Or if, hey, my neighbor is driving drunk every day, you know, or with a suspended license, or people are speeding up and down this road. Just anything they, they want to bring to us, you know, we're, that's, that's the, the purpose of the meeting. So just to get everyone in the community to come forward and just meet with us and discuss everything that's going on, so. Great. All right. Good. Well, Dave, I appreciate your time. OK, thank you very much, and uh, I'll certainly uh, do my best to uh, make it there in person. I was going to say, we'll look forward to the next time. Hopefully, see you in person. Appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. Good luck. Very good, Joe. Right. Well, thank you very right. much. Thank you. Appreciate oh. you taking the, the time to join us. And now folks know that you're not really a ghost. Right. <laughs> right. So, Thanks again. thank you. Thanks. Would it be appropriate to give him a copy of that graph that uh, Mark put together? So he, yeah. 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 He wants it. What is it? Just, just statistics that are put into graph form. Yeah. Yes. There, uh, the next one up, Joe, just for your information, we post those up on the town website, so they're available there. Okay. Uh, month to month, when the LT provides us with the numbers, we, we crunch them out into this so that month to month we're, we're looking at the same stuff and seeing what, if any, sort of changes are taking place. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. You too. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is a, a little discussion here with the uh, Alan Thompson and the Conservation Commission. If you'd love to come up. Mike Hedges. Mike. <clears throat> Over here. 
Yeah, right. Sure. Well, take a seat right here. Okay. Talk about some uh, invasive species. Okay. Glad to do it. Well, thanks for having me. Good evening. Select board members, Bill and Carla. Um, for those of you that may not know me, I live on uh, the corner of Perry Hill and Henry Huff. I've uh, been in Waterbury over 20 years, and for the last 10, I've been living uh, there in Henry Huff and been battling at least a half a dozen invasive species uh, that were on the property when I bought it during the winter months. Um, Certainly not knotweed, is it? I'm actually making some progress with knotweed. <laughs> Uh, what uh, what uh, scares me a little bit more, I think, is uh, wild chervil. Um, this is a, a very aggressive, uh, invasive plant. Uh, I have some uh, flyers on that that uh, um, I can pr produce for you. Uh, quick little uh, fact sheets on wild chervil. Um, some other ones also. Um, well, there's, a, there's an article here that I'll leave with you from the University of Vermont Extension Service that talks about wild chervil and its uh, aggressive entry into our state, uh, knotweed, which uh, most people are familiar with, and then uh, phragmites, or the common reed, um, is one that uh, uh, is pretty prevalent in town, um, as well as uh, uh, poison parsnip. So wild chervil and poison parsnip are phototoxic uh, plants so that you might have heard of this where if you cut them or get the juice on your skin and the sun is exposed to that, you'll blister um, and some, in some cases scar or, uh, from those. So it's, it's, a, it's a hazard to people playing in their fields or whatever, but it's, a, it's spread uh, rather red readily uh, by um, by seed or by rhizome, you know, uh, through the root structure, but mostly by seed. Um, the town's uh, mowing patterns tend to, uh, or the timing, it tends to be after they've gone to seed, and so we're just spreading those seeds around town. Uh, Chris, you, I don't know if you're familiar with chervil, but. Um, across from your place. Uh, the gerbil is, is another word for it. Uh, cow parsley is what I was told by the um, Davis farm. It's the white flower. It's the white flower. That's correct. gerbil, not wild gerbil. Okay. That's yeah. You're right. It's horrible. Um, and on your side of the road, where it's mowed regularly, it's pretty well kept in check. Yeah, um, I go around with a weed whacker and try to keep it at bay because I see what it's doing. Because uh, the fisherman said to me one day, how come you don't have it on your property, Chris? And that's because I'm right after it to try to keep it from going to seed. But the problem is it's so abundant across the road that it's just, you know, I, I think I'm losing, fighting a losing battle here. And uh, I, I fight it on my property by digging and pulling as much as I can, and I go up the road uh, in the direction that the mowers would come towards me and try to get it away from my property. Uh, I've uh, shared this with uh, my neighbors. I also uh, shared this with um, the newspaper, the local newspaper. About two or three years ago, there was an article on, on uh, invasives. And uh, I, I also work for the uh, Agency of Transportation, the uh, um, Asset Management Performance Bureau, and do budgeting with them. And so I've been working with the state to try to get them to also uh, have more frequent mowings to uh, knock this stuff down before it goes to seed. And um, well, I'm having difficulties there because a second mowing or an earlier mowing, it really uh, would would require a second mowing, is about another million dollars for the state of Vermont. Uh, and when would, when would the ideal time be to do the first first mowing? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I think uh, that when we, well, at least uh, when I see the mowing on Perry Hill, uh, which is, I think. Uh, around town, it's all about the same time. They, they rent the, the mowers for a week, uh, and they go through once. And that is just about the right time 
to catch it. Usually it's in, in bloom on that the first mowing of the season. Um, and so it's prior to it going to seed. Now the one of those two. Can just so if you it. mow it before it goes to seed, that doesn't do anything to that just that just kills the, the natural propagation uh, by spreading of the seeds, but uh, it can still keep growing and spreading with its root structure, right? Yes, but not nearly at the rate that it does by seed. Okay. So um, there are probably dozens of invasive plants in this town. We're not likely to eradicate any of them completely. But we do need to try to manage them because these plants are taking over uh, these environments where other plants used to be. I mean, they will force other plants out that maybe blossom later and provide uh, pollinators, flowers later in the year. They, uh, if, they show, if they're in a farmer's field that gets baled, the chervil doesn't dry as quickly as the rest of the hay, and so it can spoil the hay as well. Uh, so there's a, you know, there, there's a burning that can happen. There's a, a number of reasons why the town would want to try to uh, manage this. So in what we've passed out there, the, I've talked to the public works director about you coming in, and he's been working with the highway foreman. So uh, in 2019, we have three weeks of mowing scheduled as opposed to the one week that we've done in the past. And so we rent, as you say, we rent the roadside mower right now. So the first uh, mowing is scheduled for June 15th. The week of June 15th, and then we have uh, two more weeks uh, at the end of July and the first couple of days of August. So we we have heard some of the concerns that have been expressed to staff, and and you know the highway foreman gets a fair amount of training through both B Trans and the Vermont League of Cities and Towns about this kind of stuff. So. Um, the rest of the handout that I gave to the board is just, you know, what would options be if we wanted to have a much more aggressive mowing schedule. Uh, costs us about $3,200 a week to just rent the machine. Uh, and then, of course, we're providing the operators, so there's a week's worth of pay going along with that. Um, we used to have a uh, mower on the trackless uh, machine that we used for plowing the sidewalks and snow blowing the sidewalks. We had an over the, we had a, there's a boom, a mower arm, and actually put it over a guardrail and everything else. But it, it's costly, it's about $30,000 as you can see to buy that mower and then another $5,000 for the additional, I guess it must have a tire that uh, supports it when it's out there. Uh, so about $35,000 to buy that machine uh, to put on the trackless. Um, the note there that Celia has put in is that if we do this, we're going to have to replace the machines a lot more frequently than we do now because that it's a lot of torque and weight on that, and it just, it, the machine yeah. took a beating. The machine yeah, took a beating. Honestly, yeah, it's not the right machine for that. Yeah, it probably isn't. And then, uh, you know, going down, you can buy a, a used tractor and then, uh, you know, a new tractor. Um, you know, I don't know how different the world is today, the roadsides. Uh, as I told you a couple weeks ago, Chris, when I first came here, you know, Howard Ripley had his fireball tractor or whatever it was with a sickle bar on it and went out and just mowed with that. I don't know if that's enough or not, but um, anyway, I'm not here to recommend anything. I'm just telling you that for this year, we do have more mowing scheduled. We'll try to get, we're going to have three weeks worth as opposed to just a week or two. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't need to cut into your. No, that's right. Sounds um, like an appropriate time to say it. Well, my 
My uh, stepfather mowed the roadsides in our town of Land Grove uh, during the summer months, but I don't believe that these invasives were around back then. Now, these are relatively new, um, and um, so we're really fighting something different than what we were doing there. There, we were just trying to keep the woody, woody plants from growing. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd just like you to consider that we're up against something um, more, much more aggressive than what we've ever seen before. Uh, the poison parsnip um, that's a, that, that uh, burns people's skins even more so than the chervil, um, that is also very aggressive. It blossoms a little bit later in the year. Um, you'll, and you'll see that yellow flower, very similar in, in shape uh, to the wild chervil. Um, so, um, you know, I'd like to think that the town could try to at least hold these invasives off from doing more damage uh, to our environment than what they currently do. But the reason we came to you, and, and I'm sorry I didn't introduce the other conservation commission members, but I have John Beard and, and Alan Thompson here as well, is that we uh, received a letter from uh, Forest and Parks requesting that the Conservation Commission work with the select board to try to uh, halt the spread of chervil to the state park uh, in Little River, as it's you know, the mowing practices that we've been doing are tracking the seeds up towards the state park, and they're concerned about um, its arrival there. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we're here today. Um, so is there something besides mowing that you want us to be doing or mowing practices? Is it just timing? Um, uh, and, and the other question, I'll just ask it now. I mean, I'm concerned. I've got invasives in my yard that I'm fighting as well. Um, you know, we're talking about a six foot wide swath along the roads that we mow. And you got a, you know, a whole field in Fishman's field that's covered with this stuff. So I'm not sure, you know, what line of defense mowing six feet along the roadside is? Well, unfortunately, yeah, the, the kind of the horse is out of the gate here, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, and I understand your concern and I agree with you. You know, we, we've been kind of batting this ball around a little bit in the past here about, you know, mowing more and more frequently. But it, again, it always comes down to dollars. Um, the June 15th to 19th uh, time frame, uh, you know, I'll do do a better job there this year of trying to keep track of. Uh, I mean, it's it's well into its flowered stage at that point. <clears throat> I I don't know definitely. Um, do we know when they were mowing last year? I don't remember. Yeah. So it would be based on that. I mean, if they could get out a week before right. uh, what we did it last year, that would be terrific. Well, it says right here, wild chervil, you can see it, it blooms white flowers in May and June. It's well, like, that's what I was going to suggest, that uh, by the end of May, it's already, what I'm seeing, it's already well into bloom. Uh, and I'm, I'm after it at that point. And I'm, now I'm having to go actually up into the woods. Mm -hmm. Not only do I walk around my fields, because uh, there's areas that apparently through the ditch ways where the water runs, it's being carried that way. The seedlings are getting dragged because that's where it seems to be more prominent along the ditch lines, but I'm also seeing it up into the woods. So I'm going up in there and trying to cut it down as well and to catch it. Because I was told that if you can uh, cut it down enough before it seeds, it'll finally, it'll kill it, but I'm not seeing that happening. No, again, um, on here, on the back side, it says, do not mow after June, as the plant has said it seeds by then. So it sounds like, you know, that first one is in June. So maybe moving it up, July 22nd to August 2nd, I'm not sure what that does. If we mow it once, it, it's not, you know, we get around all the roadsides. I don't know if we can do it all in a week. 
Anyway. So, yes, some of it is uh, off the town right-of-way and on people's private proper, property, but much of it is still on the town's right-of-way and hasn't gone on to people's private property. So if we can mow the right-of-way, the whole right-of-way, which is more than six feet, or wherever we can get more than six feet, I think we're going to go a long way to arresting it if we can get, get out there before it blossoms or as it blossoms. Um, because it, it really is an issue. Um, and mowing is about the most effective thing you can do other than sp spraying herbicides all over the place, which uh, I'm sure the town um, isn't going to start doing. Um, so um, that would be my, my suggestions here uh, would be that we mow early and often and uh, that perhaps we can work with the town to, um, the Conservation Commission can work with the town to determine where the hot spots are, where, uh, you know, if it comes to that we can't mow um, everything early, maybe we can, uh, over time, determine where are the hot spots that we need to address first and maybe twice a year or something. But uh, I know on my own property, by pulling and, and mowing, uh, I'm able to uh, arrest and uh, make some headway with some of the invasive plants that we have on our property. Um, so I would encourage you uh, to consider that. I also have flyers here on knotweed um, and also um, Phragmites, the common reed, and I, th I think the uh, Conservation Commission has come to the select board and, and mentioned those two plants before because you need only look to this to the town's sand pile and Phragmites is growing on top of that. So you know, just by sanding, we're spreading seeds around town. Um, and when I lived on Maple Street, I saw the town uh, street sweeper that used to gather up sand uh, dump occasionally on the side of the road and that's where the knotweed started and it took over a large area. So there's a lot of things that we really have to consider when we're really trying to manage these invasive plants because they're insidious. Uh, well, the un other unfortunate problem we have is, uh, you know, ditching our roadsides is a must and available places to dump those ditchings mm -hmm. are limited um, and most of them end up being people's private property yep. uh, and that goes a long ways to spreading those species as well and uh, you know to find a facility that all those ditchings could be dumped at and uh, you know, I, don't, you know, I don't know if there's any way of treating that after it was you know brought to a certain area whether you could treat it to kill the invasive species you know that's that's a real real big uh, problem is how to deal with that aspect of it as well so so yeah there there's quite a bit of information out there about having healthy soils that support the native type plants it's when the soils are weakened through putting sand out there or salt uh, those types of things that weaken the, the native plants, and so these invasives just are opportunistic and take right over. It's funny, because I just, a couple days ago, for the first time ever, I heard a, a thing on, uh, it was just a commercial, UVM, but on the radio, specifically talking about the impacts of salt uh, use and how it's uh, turning our roadsides acidic, killing the natural vegetation, allowing for invasives to grow and uh, contaminating the water. And, you know, I just testified up at the State House there on the 14th. Um, Bill was there as well in reference to, uh, you know, our road problems. Uh, and uh, not only myself, but there were other uh, town officials there that were quite concerned about the amount of salt that the state's now using to to uh, keep the snow uh, melted, and it's the problems that are coming from it. Uh, one guy actually said to the representatives, you know, we've gone out of our minds with the amount of salt that we're using on our roads these days, uh, <clears throat> and something needs to be done about it. But uh, 
So now it's, I was happy to see UVM starting to address the issue. Uh, I did talk to a gal up at the uh, farm show who was in charge of the uh, Lake Champaign Plain Basin project. Um, the, she was the group that um, was working with uh, Canada and New York and Vermont on uh, you know, cleanup of Lake Champlain. <coughs> and uh, uh, she said that there's a lake in New York that uh, has been so contaminated by salt uh, that it's just, it's destroyed. There's no life left in it at, at all. And uh, I hope we don't put ourselves in that position. Right, um, and you know the invasive uh, species issue is coming up in quite a few places. Uh, Sunday at uh, UVM, there was the Northeast Farmers Association, uh, NOFA, Northeast Farming Association, and they had a workshop in, on invasive plants. And um, they had an expert there uh, who's a does consulting work and works with communities and others to uh, develop plans. Um, for how best to try to manage invasive species. Um, but I, I think, I'd like to think that between the Conservation Commission and the road crews and, um, and others interested in town, we can try to figure out where our biggest problems are and how best to manage them. And um, so I'm, um, if you need, uh, Assistance or would like recommendations. I think the select board of uh, the uh, conservation commission uh, would be glad to provide that. Um, Alan, uh, were there other things that you wanted to that you think we should hit on here tonight? Bill Woodruff came to uh, our last conservation commission meeting, and, and he was all ears. Was excited to listen to what we had to say, and we kind of concluded with. The idea that we would be presenting to him some options for for management, and then he would turn that into a action items or a budget request. So, for for next year's budget, I think there should be some research done. If you could help us with that, um, on and we just this was discussed at the uh, uh, Green Mountain Club there the night that you had the meeting up there, the little meeting on wildlife impacts there from climate change. Um, the seasonal birds that nest in the fields, uh, it was suggested that uh, these invasives were actually ruining their habitat. Um, you know, most people like uh, Sarah Squirrel up the road beyond Fishman's, um, she wasn't mowing at all. And uh, I don't recall if she mowed last fall late or not, but uh, typically people, tend to not mow until late in the season uh, because of the songbirds. And uh, from what I gathered at that meeting at the Green Mountain Club, these invasives are pushing them out of those fields uh, anyway. So for me, it's a double-edged sword. I want to keep the invasive species away. Of course, I cut and baled my hay uh, so that I, you know, the songbirds can't be there, <laughs> unfortunately. I'd love to have them, but uh, but with the invasives, it's booting them out anyway. So they're on the losing end of the stick, no matter what. Uh, well, we do when we present options to the to uh, public works folks. We would be excuse me, sorry. Um, we would be uh, just preparing a priority list and action items that we think are most important to so. One of the things I noted, uh, very good information, by the way, thank you. Um, it looked like, in addition to Bill's observation about the timing of the mowing, um, it, it also spoke to uh, cleaning of the equipment, because I can just envision that we spend the time to target these areas, mow, and then with the equipment not clean, we end up going along and mowing someplace else and spreading it more. So. I think in your conversations, that's a, it's probably a good issue to uh, to discuss as well. Well, I think yeah, I think that part of mitigating that problem is mowing ahead of time before it goes to seed. That way, the seeds don't get on the mower and get dragged. Because you're right, mm -hmm. um, you know. So if we can somehow plan it so that we're ahead enough, so that we're not actually getting into getting into the seeds, uh, I think that 
think we're beyond the better end of the stick. Bill and Celia were, were <laughs> Celia had suggested to Bill that they're very familiar with these issues and are will be welcoming of any ideas that we have, so we look forward to working with them about it. So we'll be back here next year. <laughs> okay, very good. But just off the cuff, I'd look at option number three. <laughs> well taken. Um, so I do also have this, uh, these other handouts here on the Fragmites uh, and the Knotweed so that you're fully informed of just a handful of invasives that we have here. More issues to consider. Yeah, I was just told that that was called Cal Parsley. Fragmites, I mean, common green, I guess. These come, these invasives, there's an awful lot of information out there. What they are and how best to manage them. There's only one benefit to the knotweed, and I hear it makes uh, excellent honey. So you can eat it as well. It's, yeah. It's served up in sorry many cultures. I appreciate your time, Mike. <laughs> we got you. He has some music. He doesn't want to leave. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Make a great video. <laughs> good, uh, good shot of my backside there. <laughs> Okie dokie. Thank you very much. Let's see what we can do about it. How are you tonight, Jeff? Very well. Good. Up and visit. Always a pleasure. What do you have for us? Well, this is sort of a tradition to meet with the select board a couple of weeks before town meeting. Uh, I guess we may talk about the um, who's moving the articles. Um, I just wanted to mention, um, because we had talked about this after town meeting last year, uh, just as a reminder to members of the board, I think it's very important to um, think about what you say before um, you say it. Um, stick to uh, the issues that uh, are being discussed as a, re as a result of the motions that are on the floor. And um, uh, if you think perhaps you've been speaking a little bit too long, then probably you have. And uh, aside from that, um, um, we've, 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 we've talked about it and we're looking forward to a good meeting again this year. Um, I do think it's important that, and I say this before and I get pushback every year, but that's not going to stop me from saying it again. Um, I think it's important for the select board to recognize that town meeting is not your meeting. Your meeting is when you folks meet on your regularly scheduled meetings. Town meeting is for the um, residents of the town to ask questions and hear answers and listen to what you have to say and for you to listen to what their questions are. And I think if I have 
one comment that's more important than others, it is, in many cases, I would have to say, questions that the residents of the town have about issues are more rhetorical in nature. They're asking a question, and oftentimes those questions don't need answers. And the biggest criticism that I have about the select board meeting, because I've been doing this a long time, is that the members of the select board have this feeling that every, every question that comes up needs an answer. And I don't think that's always the case. So I, I realize that, that that's a skill that you develop after going to meetings and listening to people. Uh, and so I would just um, just caution you to be careful, and if you do answer questions, be, state the facts and be brief. So I'll say this. Uh, when I first started on the board, I was quite green to the process. Um, I think I'm going on my seventh year. I still seem to have learning curves once in a while but I'm doing my best to try to get better at it. Um, your statement here about um, questions don't always need an answer. Uh, is there any benefit to perhaps either you as a moderator or if somebody comes up and makes, asks a question or would it be appropriate for you or one of the board members to say, would you like an answer to that or not? I think that's helpful. I think that's very helpful. Um, I've tried to do it on occasion. Sometimes I don't think of it. Sometimes there's a you know a lot, there's, there are other things going along, uh, going around, and I'm trying to keep track of motions or amendments or things like that. And and so I don't always get the opportunity to say that. I try to from time to time. But yes, I think that's something that both the board and I can do can can do better. Okay. Um, we also had spoken about uh, at one point here in an earlier meeting about. Uh, maybe doing something with Article 20, which was the uh, doing any other business. Uh, that may legally come before the board during the meeting. Perhaps taking and moving that around somewhere more appropriate so that we avoid the issue that we had last year. Do you have any input on that? Uh, how you feel about that? Um, I know Bill had suggested having a some conversation uh, during the middle of the meeting about well, other issues. Can you elaborate on that? So if you remember last year, the whole gun issue came up at the end of the meeting. And, and you made a couple of rulings. Some of, the, some of what you said was, you know, well, this hadn't been warned, and we really can't take any binding action. We ended up letting some people talk. And then there was criticism afterwards. Uh, some criticism afterwards suggesting that, you know, uh, had we known this issue was going to come up, we would have stayed. And, you know, you can't please everybody. I mean, people come and go throughout town meeting. So the question I asked the other meeting ago was, is it A, appropriate, and B, possible when we take the break to allow the state representatives to talk and do the, uh, you know, the, the Keith Wallace Award, that at that point, while the meeting is somewhat recessed, could you ask people there if they have any general topics that they want to talk about? The, the other business article doesn't come up until the very end, and oftentimes the crowd is thinned out and people who might have other business, just can't stay until after lunch. So it was just a conversation we had here, and we said, well, Jeff's coming in a couple of weeks, we can ask him. <laughs> I mean, you as well as me want to see interaction at the board, at the town meeting. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for the board to receive in input from our townspeople. The problem is dragging them up to the mic and getting them to speak is difficult. Um, one of the key topics that I want to discuss this year 
and I don't know, we'll talk about what article is appropriate to bring this up, is um, our deteriorating infrastructure issues and how to deal with it. Um, I don't know if you've seen any information, but um, just recently, Bill and myself and uh, Vice Chair from Stratford, along with several other representatives from towns from information that we had sent out encouraging them to come to uh, Government Day up at the State House to sit in front of the Agency of Transportation expressing our concerns and asking for a four cent gas tax to go strictly to the towns for infrastructure problems. Um, I heard you on the radio. Yeah, well, we're going to be uh, actually today, Dave Graham called me uh, Thursday morning at 9.35, we'll, uh, John Freitag, Vice Chair Stratford and myself will be there again discussing this issue. Um, I don't know if you heard me talking to the governor the other day about it. This isn't going away, you know. This is a problem that all towns are facing and it's a huge problem. Um, the reason I got involved with John was to try to find another alternative of resources because it's so huge in this town and other towns to help try to pay for these infrastructure projects. <coughs> we simply just can't burden ourselves with the amount of money it's going to take to fix them through property taxes. It's impossible. Uh, so I want to have that discussion at town meeting. It doesn't look like the state's interested in addressing the issue this year. You know, I'm gonna, I'd like to have a discussion at town meeting as to how people feel about the issue, what their ideas are, what they would propose or like to see uh, other than property tax, you know, attachment, <laughs> I guess. And uh, how would you feel that what, what approach would we take, should we take on that? Well, because it's not something that you have warned, it's, I would suggest, most appropriate under Article 20. Um, the issue I think that you're trying to get at is you want to discuss that, or you'd like to discuss that, you'd like to get as much involvement as possible. When is a good time to um, bring up Article 20. And I think if, if, if you want to do it under Article 20, again, I think that's the most appropriate place for it. You can always suspend the rules to move Article 20 up to whenever you want to talk about it and whenever you think there are the most people there. And a motion to suspend the rules, you can do either by unanimous consent or suspension of the rules, which merely requires a two-thirds vote. Um, just an, another question. Uh, did you, in the select board report, did you write about infrastructure at all? I did. So Article 4 is to act upon the reports of the sev several town officers with the exceptions of claims and compensation. So that is usually the time we tell them if you have questions about last year's budget, but if they had a question about town manager's report, if they had a question about the select board report, the plan was, they could ask those questions there, right? Then I would suggest get a plan. So you've got to find somebody to ask a question under Article 4 to bring up the select board report and, and say, you know, you express some concerns about infrastructure. Why don't you tell us about it? Mm. I mean, I, I think you can do that. Oh, I, I, th I think you can too. But I think again, it's got to be relatively limited under that particular right. article. It's not something you can spend a whole half hour on or something like that. So maybe yeah, it's hard. It's hard to. It's hard to. Uh, it's hard to solve problems when you have limited input, you know, that's the, that's the issue mm -hmm. there. Um, and it's hard to get people, I guess, to wake up and, and pay attention to some of these critical issues if you don't have these important discussions. So, um, yeah, I think we probably could find somebody that... But, again, Jeff just <coughs> said that that really needs to be limited sure. scope. So, you know, maybe suspending the rules and moving Article 20 
up would be the better move. That would that would that would let you have a more wide ranging discussion mm -hmm. because of the nature because of the nature of Article Twenty. Mm -hmm. You just have to realize that um, should someone want to make a motion, that you'll hear me state that. Um, any action that's taken is not going to be binding on the select board under Article 20. Yeah, well, at this point, I, I'm just looking for yeah. information, input. Yeah. Uh, how's the rest of the board feel about that? Any comments? I mean, my, my only quick thought is, as we look at the meetings following town meeting to put it out there that we're going to make it a major discussion at one of these meetings. And I, I don't know how much, how many answers we're going to get at town meeting versus speaking you know, at length in one of these meetings. I understand that you have more people as input, but if we're looking at things that we don't have control over, we have control over tax rate, we don't have control over what the state does. I guess there's things we can lobby for as a town I think having a better consensus from the public as to how they feel about this issue might give us a better direction to go in. Um, obviously, you know as well as I do, you're not going to get the people coming to one of these meetings that you're going not even a fraction of what you're going to have. And you could call a special meeting as a select board meeting to talk about roads, sure. but I'm guaranteeing you, you're going to see about what you got here now. Uh, well, we did that when we had the discussion on the state police. We you know, if, you, if you want to have discussion on it, have, have discussion on, on the budget and have someone make a motion to increase the, um, the uh, highway budget by a sufficient amount enough to take care of the roads. <laughs> We'd be run out on a rail. I mean, that'll, that'll help you with your discussion. <laughs> and you'll get some ideas. <laughs> and it'll also make a much more interesting meeting yeah. for me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Mark, uh, well, I mean, either any of you here, I mean, uh, what's the objection to moving Article 20? I mean, nothing says it's got to stay there forever. If it, if it, if it works out that uh, it's a flop, I mean, next year it goes back to the end of the line. Uh, I'm just trying to get more people engaged about some of the issues, and we've solved pretty much everything else in this town when it comes to municipal issues for the most part. We've got a handle on our police enforcement, we've got a handle on our municipal building, our library, our fire stations. Really the only big ticket left is our infrastructure, and that's huge. It's What percentage of our budget is it, Bill? Well, the highway budget is probably more than a third of the budget, easily. Yeah. And, it's get, and it's going to be getting a lot worse if we don't start addressing the issues. So well, and I think I'll leave it up to you guys to decide. Um, I would, you know, I would suggest, I think, if you want to have a wide ranging discussion on this issue or any issue, um, Think about what you want to do and make a decision as soon as possible. And then, you know, starting a week or 10 days before town meeting, just start putting um, posts in front page forum that, that if you want to move Article 20 up, so you're going to go Articles 1, 2, 3, 4, 20, and then 5, 6, 7, 8 to 19. And the reason why is maybe that'll help you because a lot of people read front page forum. And maybe that's a vehicle to, to uh, get people interested to come and discuss at a town meeting, even if you leave Article 20 at the very end. Because I think had it, while it was an interesting discussion on the whole gun issue, I think, as was pointed out, a lot of people would have stayed had they known that it was going to be there. If 
you start publishing in front page forum that you encourage people to talk about how we're going to pay for for uh, infrastructure improvements and the various alternatives, i.e., increase in the gas tax as opposed to a 25 or 30 cent increase in the municipal property tax rate, you might get some people to come and, and stick around for the meeting, for the, for the, for the last article. I can't remember if it was last meeting or the meeting before where Bill talked about making it a priority to start to make a plan surrounding at least the road scenario that we've talked about. We have never really asked Bill to heavily work through a game plan there. I, I, I just don't like going into town meeting and making people fear things and costs and future and, you know, I think we were presenting a budget on what we believe is right now, and then I think we talk about what our plan is moving forward and knowing that that is one of the biggest focuses for 2019, that we tell them what the plan is versus necessarily making it look like we don't have a plan. I think that's the worst thing we can do is sit there and say, we don't know what to do about this. Be scared. It's gonna cost you a bunch of money in the future. Where I'm seeing this conversation go around, and, and it actually goes back, Chris, to your, your initiative with this four cent gas tax proposal. And, it's, and at the earlier meetings we talked about was just the, the timing and the groundwork that you have to lay before you try to get that. But you've, uh, you and John um, uh, really, I think, had a good impact there. And there's a bill that's been introduced relative to that. Um, so the thing is, uh, the governor is opposed to it, and the primary committee leaders that would be integral in moving it forward are not interested in doing it. I think the crux of your discussion is trying to get uh, feedback from uh, folks in the community, how they feel about that. Um, strikes me as though that would be a topic under Article 20, um, and, and that would be your opportunity to, uh, to speak about that. And the question is, do we leave Article 20 where it is and have that diminished group, or do we look to move it up? And uh, Jeff's point about kind of getting that word out there to uh, have folks thinking about it and, and weighing the, the pros and cons to it and also letting them know that we're interested in hearing feedback from them um, makes good sense. So it's just a matter of the mechanics of utilizing Article 20. Do we leave it where it is or do we do uh, the process of trying to suspend the rules moving it up? When you said two thirds uh, vote on uh, the rule suspension. That's two thirds of those in attendance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We could do that by show of hands. Mm -hmm. So, could you ask the specific question under Article 20? Would you like to spend or to, to move Article 20, spend the rules, move Article 20 on the premise to discuss issues pertaining to? how to move forward with some different options or look into different options. I don't know how you would word it in reference to how to help mitigate some of our infrastructure expenses. Well, I'm not going to do that. I would entertain a motion that that, that, that be done. And a motion to suspend the rules is in order, and I'm happy to work with, with you or anyone else on a motion um, so that it comes up. Um, moderators can't make motions. So, so Jeff, to, to your point earlier, and I'm, I'm starting to wonder a little bit about the uh, expediency of moving Article 20 up. Um, you talked at the beginning of the meeting, or when you came, that this is really the town's meeting, not the select board's meeting. Mark, you suggested that maybe we try to advertise and get people to come to select board meetings to talk and help as we 
build the budget for next year, what we're going to do for infrastructure. If we move Article 20, um, my first question that was formulating was, okay, how do we get out of Article 20 to get on to Article 5? Because at no time is anybody really going to be able to say, I call the question on Article 20. That's because the problem with any other Article 20. Mm -hmm. So if you move it up, this is the select board's issue. Mm -hmm. And we might spend a lot of time talking about it. And then we're going to want to move to the budget and other things. And maybe now we've precluded other business from coming up from the public. So I'm not sure it makes it makes sense to move it up in terms of having a lot of people to talk about your issue, but it might not be their issue, and they may have other issues they want to talk about under Article 20, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this one issue and never get to anything else. So I'm... That was my concern with moving it I think maybe just leaving it where it is and dealing with whoever is there to talk about the issue. Um, you know, I... I uh, and I think Jeff's point about the fact that this is the town meeting as opposed to the select board meeting, you have 24 meetings a year that you can put this on your agenda, right? So. Well, I mean, yeah, I understand it's the, tip, it's the voters meeting. But do you really think that that kind of cold turkey that you're going to get a lot of real interaction from the public about, I mean, you think about infrastructure every hour that you're awake, every day. Well, I think, I and, think and about I'm, this particular I'm not so sure I so think many about others this too. particular infrastructure problem because of its potential impact to the property tax and the residents of the town of Waterbury. I guess that's my biggest concern. Uh, but is it if, it, if, other than, if it wasn't for that, <coughs> I probably wouldn't be so concerned about it. Is it possible to split Article 20 and have an equal opportunity to bring up business at the end like normal and to add <laughs> a section in? No. I mean, it, I... I mean, there's a, there's a fair amount of people that show up for town meeting are elderly. They're not going to... Probably aren't going to stick around. Well, I'm not aiming at you, Ann. You could just, You're still can you just say that there may be some interesting discussions under Article 20? So think about staying to the end of the meeting? Absolutely. Absolutely. As there was last that be year. Oh, I could read things <laughs> like that in all during the meeting. I have no problem with that. And, 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 and we have some interesting precedent to, to, uh, to say, you know, don't leave. <laughs> you never know what's going to come up. You might miss something. Meanwhile, there could be some stuff. Of course, I don't, I don't think I've ever looked at front porch forum in my life. Uh, I try to stay away from that black hole as much as possible. But. Uh, I suppose that there's somebody that probably could put some information out there. Uh, yeah, I just thought it might be a good opportunity to, mm -hmm. to, to get some feedback. Uh, heavens knows we don't have a lot of opportunity for that. Well, as I think to Bill's point, you probably would get better discussion if you well publicized a select board meeting where you were going to spend an hour on how do we pay for infrastructure needs because i think people would people who are interested in that topic would come to the meeting and um, <laughs> you might get an even bigger attendance than than you would at town meeting if you're going to, if if people know in advance that these are some of the issues that you're talking about, and it's a potentially big pocketbook issue. I mean, if I'm going to be on DEV there on Thursday, uh, I, I'm certainly going to throw a pitch towards 
you know, perhaps somebody wanting to have this discussion at the end of town meeting. That seems to be the most appropriate time based on you know, the articles mm -hmm. that we have. Uh, I, I can tell you one thing, in the, in the time that I've been on the board, one of my more frustrating points or concerns, I guess, is that people's reluctance to want to get involved until issues become explosive just it gets to me after a while. <clears throat> you know, I feel like throwing my hands up and back in my bags and go somewhere where I don't have to worry about it. You know, move to Holland. <laughs> yeah. I got a place already more than more than Maine, where there's a population of 38 people. So uh, I can really distance myself up there. But uh, you know, it's like it's almost like you're putting in the effort, but nobody seems to be there with you. Well, you know, if you want to talk about that, um, go to that, go to the annual Harwood meeting. <laughs> I was there. I did go to one meeting. Yeah. I you know, the, you. the members of the board outnumber the members of the public. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So is there a consensus that we're just going to leave it the way it is? Is that what I'm hearing? Sounds like it. Okay. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> but as I've said to as I've said to you before, Chris, and as, as I've said tonight, and as I say to folks, you know, occasionally, <coughs> occasionally I'll get a call before town meeting and. I am absolutely willing to work with anybody on putting together a motion that they want either to amend an article or something that goes into new business. Um, just because we put it together, as I tell people, doesn't mean it's going to be a success, but I'm happy to get them to the place where they can at least feel like they've had their time discussing things. And, and, and for me, I think that's the most important part about town meetings. And I'm always willing to help folks do that. I think uh, one comment on your comment about not necessarily answering every question, sometimes I fear because we have a lot of time in meetings that we do discuss things in detail, that if someone were to state something that basically is a question, but it's more of a statement and the question of whether or not it really needs to be answered. I would fear that since we're kind of put on display that if we sit there and stare back at them and don't answer or say anything when it's posed as a question, it can be misinterpreted as we don't care or we're not listening. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's, that would be one concern in those, in those scenarios that I don't want anyone to feel like we're not thinking through or addressing concerns. So I, I guess that's one thing that I have to kind of think about how I feel about that sometimes. Well, you know, maybe another way of, of, of dealing that, it, dealing with that is when someone asks a question that may sound more like a comment than a question. Um, I can be um, more attuned to saying, is there just as a means of, of seeing where they are, is saying, is there a particular member of the select board that you'd like to address that? And that way, if they say, well, no, I guess I don't, or, well, I'd just like my question answered, then we can, then we can move on from there. <clears throat> OK. Um, did you want to go through the distribution of the articles? It's up to the board, that's your choice. Fine with me, you guys pick what you want and I'll suck up the rest, I guess. <laughs> Just go through them article by article. Mm -hmm. 
I'll do the first one. Get Jeffrey elected again. Okay. Articles two and three are Australian ballot. No discussion. Article four to accept the reports. I'll do the next one. Bill. Bill. And then dates for tax rate. I'll do the tax rate. Yeah. Jane's not here, so we get to pick which one we have her do. Throw her under the bus, you say? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I don't care which you guys, whatever one you want me to, or a couple or whatever, I don't care. We're on Article 7 now, are we? Yeah. Let's do Chris and Jane and keep going. I can take sure. that. I can take Article 7, huh? Yeah, Chris. And then Jane for Article 8. Yeah, then I can I can do Article Nine. Mark will do ten. Mark Fryer. Fryer. Jane do eleven. I get to do that one last year. Mark did it the year before, so. so. For that. <laughs> you got to read all that. Yep. Yep. I think you have to read it twice. I think you have to read it twice. Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I need more mic time. There you go. <laughs> no, Jeff's got to read it twice. No, so he only reads it once. He reads it once, he reads it twice. All right. Mark, Article 10 is who? Mark Fryer. Okay. What's that? And I have to tell you that the person that typically reads Article 8 more than anyone because I read it once, I read it as a motion, I read it again. I, I probably read that more than anyone else. I was late on my taxes last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's six. We all have that senior moment. Yes, we do. Thank you for not right. complaining about it. <laughs> hey, it was my own fault. <laughs> I muttered a little bit, but didn't I, Carla? Was it the second installment? No, it was the first. All right, that's not so bad. <laughs> okay, thank you. Look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thank, thank you very much, Thank you, Jeff. Jeff. That was the moderator's workshop. I had an emergency hearing and didn't go. Oh, okay. So Bill, the one question I had was uh, if, the, if the motion for the uh, money for the uh, ambulance is in Article 7, why is it in a special article as well? It should be. It's not. It got taken out, right? Weren't we originally going to put it in a special article? No, no. I, I had it listed in it's special listed articles. Special articles. Um, on the spreadsheet, the town report. I, oh, on the report, the town report? Okay, I thought it was somewhere. Yeah. But it, so it is a special article, but it's not under Article 11. It's a, its own special article. Mm -hmm. But it's still in the, in the articles that are, that are listed in the report. It's still in Article 7? It's only in Article 7. Okay. So it comes up. So I think especially, I think it was be listed no. here. In it's the listed with those in the spreadsheet in the town report, but it's its own separate article on the warning. Right. I, it's fine, Chris. Don't okay. worry about it. All right. We're not doubling up. Okay. <laughs> I would like to it's as if it were Article 17. It's just we're moving it to the beginning of the meeting because it has significant budget impacts. Yes. And we want more people there than less. Um, anything else here for this? Okie dokie. Thanks again, Jeff. Okay, thanks. Uh, Article 8.
manager's items. The rest is up to you. But. Okay, uh, so very quickly, it won't take long to get through these. Um, I would like uh, the board to authorize uh, the approval of, of a grant agreement and then sign the grant agreement. We agreed, or the select board agreed back months ago to apply for a uh, planning grant to look into the concept of a community center. Uh, there's been no commitment made that we're gonna have a community center, but it was just to hire a consultant to uh, look at the community, uh, involve some of the other organizations in the community, like the senior center that's looking to do something more for a community center than we have now. Um, the grant award uh, was made to us. It's a $35,000 grant. There is a $11,250 match. Uh, the select board already authorized the use of uh, $6,250 of community development revolving loan fund money toward that match. So it's not taxpayer dollars, not local taxpayer dollars anyway. Uh, and then the other 5,000 is uh, in-kind staff time that would go towards it. Um, so I would ask for a motion to be uh, made accepting the conditions of the grant and sign it. I'd like to make that motion. So moved. Yeah, based on. Your second? Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Uh, motion carries. Staying consistent. I'm staying consistent. Yes. Next is uh, North Star Fireworks yeah, contract. Um, the town has been paying for the fireworks uh, display, and um, I just like the authority, the authorization of the board to sign this agreement. It's for the MQID. It's uh, um, ten thousand dollars. It's in our budget. We've done this uh, for the last four or five years. All right, I'll make the motion that we authorize the manager to sign the North Star Fireworks contract for the NQID celebration. I second that. No further arguments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, just calling your attention again um, to the email that I sent out the other day, I sent you all the new bylaws for the Waterbury Ambulance Service. Um, each of the governing boards of the towns that uh, WASI serves now has the ability to appoint one trustee. Um, not that I'm asking you to do it tonight, but uh, they have a meeting at the end of April. It would be nice to have a trustee in place appointed by the town by that meeting so the person could attend that meeting. Typically, our, you know, we point all the rest of our, we're starting in May, don't they? Yeah. So we'd have to move this up. Um, there's, do you want us to advertise that there's a position of a, trustee to WASI available and have interested parties contact Carla or me and then bring those names before the board, schedule them to come for an interview or what have you, but it would be good if we could get, you so know, in, in, before in March, yeah. uh, so we we'll get an advertisement out. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. 
And uh, that's it except for the, uh, the legal issue that we have here, and I would recommend that you go into executive session for that. I'll move to find that general public knowledge of the details of potential litigation involving the town of Waterbury would clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I move to enter executive session to consider potential litigation involving the charge of Mr. Oak and K.O. versus Town of Waterbury and related confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing legal advice to the town. Is there another second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 